Today is December 23rd, 2019. My name is Blair Williams. I'm here in the reading room of the Cumberland County Historical Society with Dr. Alessio Rosario Jr. Yes. All right. Very good. Well, so you mentioned, so how, so how, how do you normally introduce yourself to people? I, I introduce myself as Alessio Rosario. Um, because for, and that's not an easy name to remember, which is why some other people know me by other names. We'll get back to that. Okay. But Eliseo, uh, because when I was very young, it was uh, anglicized, and it always grated my ear to be called Eliseo. Mm. Um, so I, I, I guess it was in school, in college, when I started taking a position on that and insisted that that be said Eliseo. There are very few people that I would let, uh, let get away with calling me Eliseo. Very few. That list is very, very short. Uh, is Eliseo or one of my other monikers? Okay. Well, uh, so <clears throat> I think you know, one of the questions I always like to start off with is uh, sort of uh, you know, going back to your childhood. So where, where did you grow up and where, or where were you born? I was born in New York City on 23rd Street and 1st Avenue, which happens to be across from Bellevue Hospital. I mention that because I don't know uh, how much that came into play in terms of my career decisions. Mm. Um, we moved from 23rd Street and 1st to the public houses where I really feel that's where I grew up, the Baruch houses on the Lower East Side, between Delancey and Houston Street. Um, by the Williamsburg Bridge. Uh, and that's where, uh, till I was 20, I went to school in the neighborhood, PS 97, that was in front of the building, junior high school 22, which was behind our building. And um, did my schooling there. And interestingly, I grew up in that neighborhood, but I spent a good deal of time in East Harlem in my cousin's neighborhood, and downtown by the Brooklyn Bridge with another cousin. So cousin on my mother's side was downtown, cousin on my father's side was uptown. My theory is that because I was a transient in all those neighborhoods, I was always a gypsy, a nomad. Mm -hmm. I never got sucked into the bad elements. Mm -hmm. I went to school away from my high school, away from my neighborhood. And I think that I was less apt to get sucked into the whirlpool that sucked all of my peers. That's my theory. Now when you say peers, are those the, the friends that you grew up with? Or people I grew up family? with in the neighborhood, yeah. People I grew up with, the, my, the, my peer group, uh, we came up together. Um, they have the cliche story, mm -hmm. stuck there, dead, or in jail. Mm -hmm. That's was what that neighborhood was like back in the day. Well, I was wondering if you could, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about your, your parents as well. My parents, uh, interesting. Uh, my mom uh, had a fifth grade education. She was a factory worker and domestic, mostly. My dad, eighth grade education, um, and he, would, he worked in the garment district. So he, he had some skills. And of note, my dad is the one who taught me my Spanish. He made me read the Spanish dailies. And he taught me my math. He was good with numbers. He was impressively good with numbers. Um, and both those things I attribute to him, you know, because those, he's directly responsible. He used to give me quizzes, math quizzes, <laughs> that I'd be more nervous about than the ones I took in school. Really? Yeah. And were you, were you named after him? Or? Yes, he is okay. uh, Eliseo, Eliseo Sr. And he, he went by the... The non-anglicized version. Correct. Okay. That's, that's how he was known, Ellie. His, uh, my mother used to call him Ellie. Oh. Um, um, but his, his name was Ellie Sale. And what was your mother's name? My mother's name was Gladys. Gladys. Yes. Okay. And I, I see, were, they're both, were they both from Puerto Rico? Yes, or? they're both from Puerto Rico. Uh, they came in the 40s, and my mother's story is that she came first, and he came after her. We'll, we'll let that sit. Well, all right, all right. All right, and they got their education in Puerto Rico? Or yes, they? yes, it was in Puerto Rico. Here they came just to look for economic for opportunities. Work. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 was, that was a story back then. And they lived in, you know, neighborhoods that were predominantly Latin, 
And then when public housing sprung up, they, we migrated down. So I'm, my sense is I'm from the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. That's my identity. Um, well, do you have any specific uh, really a memory of that neighborhood that stands out to you? Any buildings or people or? Yeah, it was, I mean, uh, the Lower East Side was always unique in that it was more heterogeneous than others. So, for instance, when I went uptown to visit my cousin, that was a black and brown community. On the east side, mm -hmm. it was a Latin community. On the west side, it was a black community. When I went downtown to my other cousins, that was near Chinatown. So there was a heavy Asian presence there. In my part of town, it was a much more mixed bag. Mm -hmm. Whites, blacks, Asians, uh, Jewish community. And so in, those in my neighborhood, someone different did not stick out as much as in those others. So if I went uptown, and if I went to the west side, I fell out of place, looked out of place. I certainly blended in the, uh, yeah. the east side. And then downtown, not so much either, because there were Hispanics there, and there were Asians, and they kind of crossed paths on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. But in my neighborhood, we had goths walking around. We had you know east villagers yeah. uh, walking around. And it was just not, it just drew, didn't draw any attention. I've always, I've always been impressed with that, that the Low East Side was much more heterogeneous than any other community. Mm -hmm. You can blend in there no matter what you look like. Yeah. Hmm. Did, but it, sort of in all that blending in, did anyone stand out to you? No. No? No, because, you know, when you, when you live in the projects, um, you know, you got neighbors that are living next door to you, you don't necessarily connect. Mm. It's, um, and like I said, because I was always somewhere else, yeah. I had connections in other parts of the city that were stronger than the ones in my own neighborhood. Um, and, and, and I, I, well, I might add that a, a part of my, part of how I developed had to do with the fact that I was born with a hearing loss. And I was legally blind out of one eye. Mm. Um, so much so that in my public school days, I was sent to the school for the deaf to be assessed. I was not deaf enough to qualify for that facility. But it certainly impacted on how things unfolded for me. So um, an interesting story. Um, I had an aunt uh, who was kind of the matriarch of the family, my father's sister. And she, in that household, was probably one of the more educated women. So she had an interest. She had no children, but she had her fingerprints on all of her nieces and nephews, mm -hmm. all of them. And it was her one day, I'm hearing her tell me a story, that she was talking to someone about how she couldn't accept the fact that things were so difficult for them because she had a nephew who was handicapped with loss of sight and loss of hearing and still managed to do a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. That was the first time, and I was an adult. I was already not a young adult. The first time that it ever dawned on me that uh, I was handicapped. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking about it, I'm saying, well, technically she's correct, but I just never, I saw it as a huge nuisance, but I just didn't see it as a handicap. So it affected my ball playing because I didn't have any depth of field. I was always uh, the one guy got picked on when we were playing running hiding games at night because I couldn't see people. And the joke was, oh, you can sit right in front of the bench and he'll pass right past you, he won't see you. Uh, when the police came and we had to run out of the grass, I'd be running toward the police because I didn't see them. Uh, so that was a nuisance. It was a yeah. nuisance uh, in a lot of aspects. You mentioned earlier that you went to sort of elementary and junior school, you know, sort of right, right next to where you Correct. lived. Correct. And you, you didn't attend a local school when you went to high school. Correct. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, what your high school experience was? Well, that, that's, a, that's a, a pivotal point because I, uh, was, oh, I was interested in going into medicine and pediatrics, which was my specialty, in middle school. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So... My counselor had suggested that I take this test to go to Brooklyn Tech. There were three high schools, public high schools in New York City, which you take an exam to get into. Brooklyn Tech, an engineering school. Uh, Stuyvesant, which is a college preparatory school. And Bronx High School of Science. 
My intention was to go to the Bronx High School of Science. They were going to prepare me. That's what I wanted to do. I took the test to Brooklyn Tech, and you took the test to Brooklyn Tech. I went to a junior high school. That means you did seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. So you take the test in the eighth grade, and you leave junior high school to go to the high school. Uh, I passed the test. I told my counselor I wasn't going because that's not what I was interested in. He had a cow. I mean, I get it. I mean, this was a feather in their cap having a student of theirs representing them at this school. I wasn't going. That's not what I was interested in. I was going to go to Bronx High School. I took this test as a practice for next year for Bronx High School of Science. Called my mother. They went crazy. They said, no, he has to go. He, you know, how could he not go? So I went. Mind you, this is a school in Brooklyn of 6,000 students. My graduating class was 1,500. My graduating class was the last all males class. Of the 6,000, there were 134 Hispanics, total. To say that we were a little out of place. But it, was, it wasn't until I met a physician who advised me to stay at the school, he went to that school, it would prepare me. And in fact, it did, because the work there was brutal. Even the, even the students who did not, I was in the college preparatory track. Even those guys, we had to take engineering classes, drafting, mechanical drawing, freehand drawing. I mean, we had to do that along with our academics. The guys who did the engineering stuff would, would finish there, go to college, and place out, place out of their first year of school because they'd already covered it. That's the kind of place it was. Uh, and it was, a, a, it was an enlightening experience because, um, it, it, again, it took me out of my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It put me in, a, but, but it put me in an environment that made the high school so much less personal. And it wasn't until I was attending football games, my son's football games, that I began to appreciate why people got all misty-eyed about their high school days. Because it's about the socialization that occurs at these events. But we didn't have those events. We'd come from all over the city. At the end of the day, we disperse and go to our respective places. I mean, there was really no emotional ties mm -hmm. to high school. <clears throat> it was a, a monstrous building, 12-story building, thousands of, you know, almost like an anthill, thousands of guys coming in from various train stations, like a factory. Uh, it was an interesting experience, an interesting experience. It definitely prepared me. It definitely prepared me. So you went from uh, Brooklyn Tech, and then you ended up going to the Albert Einstein Medical Center? No, I went to Fordham University at the Lincoln Center, which was brand new at the time. Um, they had no residences. They have now. Hmm. Uh, it was you know, right next to the Lincoln Center. It was quite a different part of town. Um, it was there that I met Sonia. Um, okay. uh, Sonia is your, was your first wife. Correct. Uh, we got married. We were still in school. In fact, the day, the Saturday we got married, I had classes that day. I didn't attend. I cut classes because I had a wedding to go to. Um, yeah, and, and uh, we were together for 42 and a half years. Wow. So I was 20 when I got married. So, you know, um, an interesting story, I, when, when, um, when my son turned 20, we were driving back on 81, and it had just dawned on me, they said, you know, Ian is 20, he could, barely, he could barely take care of himself, he wouldn't be able to take care of the family. And it hit me right then and there. I said, oh goodness, that's what they thought about us. And my wife looked at me and she said, are you crazy? Of course they thought you were nuts. You're 20 years old, Puerto Rican, and you're planning to go to medical school. And you're married. Yeah. Really? I mean, are, that, are you betting on that? I said, I, I, I always thought I knew what I was doing. And she said, you were the only one. She didn't even think that. Well, no, she, um, she, she bought in. Okay. She bought in. Um, but, but, yeah, she, she said, now, now is when you realize that because, you know, everybody thought that. Everybody thought you were crazy. I mean, you, you just, you were just outlandish in the things that you wanted to do. Um, 
She, by the way, had a good deal to do with the eventual outcome. Had a lot to do with uh, who and what I am today. So Can, cannot a, overstate that. It was a good choice. What? It was a good choice. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, and it created, it created a problem because, um, you know, once I opted to stay with her, it put me in communicado with my, uh, with my parents, my family, my mother in particular, who, who had her trophy son stolen from her. Mm. So, um, that was, um, it was tumultuous time for, for a lot of reasons. And she was a significant glue that kept it together. And had blind faith. She, yeah. She's the one that, uh, and of course she gave me Ian, our son. What, what did you study? It was Lincoln at, at University? For the University Ford was, Ford, I sorry, did okay. a, so, so the place was so new that they didn't have any science majors. It was, it was uh, social science and natural science. Well, how, how did you find yourself there then? Uh, I, I had applied to some schools. I, I, it was local. They offered some financial assistance. Because, mm -hmm. you know, what I didn't realize was that coming out of tech, that, that gave you quite a bit of vetting. Um, but at tech, you know, the brilliant people were brilliant, but the mediocre people were also no dummies because, you know, we were all smart in that school. We just didn't realize it at the time. And so, and, and the workload was so much lighter in, this, in college. I mean, in college, you're taking three classes a day. I'm thinking, three classes a day? Psh, you got to be kidding me. I mean, tech, we were taking eight classes a day. And they were all majors. So the workload was significantly less. I said, oh, I can do this. I mean, and it allowed me to commute from home. I mean, I, I was still living at home, so it was a short train ride up to Midtown. It was, I don't know what formulated that. You know, and it wasn't like I consulted anyone for this. It wasn't like I went home and talked by college choice with my parents. Um, they, 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 you know, by the time I was in high school, they were out of the picture already because they couldn't help me with anything. They couldn't, they had no clue what was going on in my life because that was, that was an alien environment for them, uh, as theirs to their parents being in this country as opposed to their parents coming from the old country. Um, they just, they just couldn't help me. So a lot of us at that time were feeling our way. I mean, when they talk about the path being blazed by some people, I mean, there was nobody that we were we can go to that can guide us. Those people were far and few apart. I mean, there were just not that many people around. We were all kind of finding our way. And we would compare notes with each other, but we didn't have anybody to talk, at least in my circle. I didn't have anybody that was going to be able to give me any compass readings or guidance. It was definitely uh, uh, on the job and learning as you go. So you found yourself at Fordham, which didn't exactly offer too many science classes. No, but they had enough to, to, to you know, that was an advantage too because I was science slanted. Um, I remember the, because the upperclassmen had preferences, they got chemistry and general chem first, uh, organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. And so physics I took in my first year which is not how you generally do it. And uh, it was, he was not a great physics teacher. So the second semester, we wound up with six people in the class. Um, and, and, you know, we kind of survived physics because the prof needed to, to show that he can teach his class. And, and, and he was not a great teacher, so. And the subject is, is it's kind of a foreign language to begin with, so you're kind of learning this foreign language from a guy with a bad accent. It, it made for a difficult, bumpy road. But getting that out of the way early was an advantage. So it was a real advantage. 
And the place was trying to establish itself as a bona fide uh, producer of scientists, so they had a vested interest in getting their people into schools, medical schools. But, you know, you had the reality of, you know, uh, of uh, subjective people who were making those decisions. Mm -hmm. And this is back in the day, so it was a different situation. It was a climb. It was, a, it was an uphill climb for many, many reasons. Well, then you, you eventually found yourself at the Albert Einstein Medical Center. Correct. Was that your first choice, or is that just... Well, I, I had, I remember I was, we were already married. Mm -hmm. My first acceptance came from Buffalo. And I remember <laughs> when I did the interview at Buffalo, there was snow, you know, it was, yeah. it was so deep, it was ridiculous. Um, and they did, and they, and they, and they had classes on Saturday, which I thought was a little ridiculous. Little did I know that it's 24-7 when you're in med school. It's Saturday, Sunday, doesn't matter. It's... If there's work to be done, and you're doing a class, or you're doing it somewhere else, it really doesn't matter. But that was our first uh, acceptance, and we're jumping up and down by the mailbox. Um, but the others were out of town, so Albert Einstein was one that was seemed to fit better. And what was the environment like that? The environment at Albert Einstein was hostile. Um, the attitude was that, you know, they were federally mandated to accept certain people, but they didn't have to graduate them. And that was ironic to me because this was a school that was established because the Jewish community didn't have places to go to. They were, the, the Jewish community had been subjected to the very same condition that they were subjecting to others. Mm. And when you, when I spoke to my peers in other places, guys I graduated from school with, it was the same experience almost everywhere. It was a an exclusive club that wanted to be stay exclusive, and and I understood that because admission of, of a person like myself, now you don't have a means of controlling this individual. And, and I always saw that as a means of medicine. I went into pediatrics for three reasons. One was to have um, the flexibility of being able to work whenever, however, because no matter what happens, if the system collapses, you're still marketable. You still have skills that will be needed. The second was that I wanted to be visible evidence to young people coming behind me like myself, that is doable. That's why pediatrics, mm -hmm. because you impact the young not only in their health, but their mental attitude. And thirdly, I wanted to be a medical resource for my family. And once you have that, they cannot take it back. So I understood why they made it as difficult as it was, because it is quite a bit of leverage to have. The, the reasons you gave, was that already formed in middle school? Oh, that was already. I knew, I knew, I knew the impact I wanted to have on the young in middle school. Mm -hmm. I knew that you were going to have economic stability no matter what happens. Um, the medical resource to the family came later when I realized that in in you know when you're sitting and you have physicians talking to their patients in medical ease, and the patient doesn't understand what they're saying, mm -hmm. but doesn't ask, is when I realized that. And, and when my family goes to the, to the doctor, or they get hospitalized, they tell the person early on, oh, my, doc, my brother is a physician. They have a different interaction after that point. And that's what I wanted. I wanted my family to have a little more uh, even footing mm. in that in that environment. And that, that has happened. That has happened. So, so Albert Einstein was this exclusive club. Medicine is an exclusive Medicine, club. Okay. And Albert Einstein is just one of the campuses. Sure. But you broke into it? Yes. <laughs> All right. So, 
<clears throat> did did they have were you, you were able to specialize in pediatrics there as well? No, the medical school you wind up getting a rotation in everything. Okay. You do general surgery. You do orthopedics. You do. Uh, you do uh, OBGYN. So the first year, the first years you spend in the classroom. Mm -hmm. The second two years you spend on the clinical side, where you're actually working with patients. You're working under an intern, mm -hmm. resident, an attending, and learning uh, medicine in the flesh and your bedside manner, mm -hmm. because you you. That's not. That's not necessarily taught. I mean, that's why some guys do and some guys don't have bedside manners. Um, and then once you finish medical school, then you get into a residency where you become whatever mm -hmm. you're going to become, pediatric surgery. Now, this is essentially like this giant, I don't know, it's like funnel where every year you're seeing your peers just drop out or... No, not, not in that setting. I mean, there are people who walk away from it, um, because they, you know, I mean, it's a stressful, yeah. it's a very stressful situation. Um, there are some residencies that are like that, that are competitive. So surgery, for instance, you start out with 10, you end up with one. Mm -hmm. And as, the, as, the, as you do a three-year residency, people funnel out into other areas, you know, uh, obstetrics, uh, urology, um, gastroenterology, uh, surgical subspecialties. Because you, from, from the group, you're only going to have one chief resident. Uh, most other residencies, you all come up together. Okay. Well, I guess, I, maybe that was the wrong question, but I mean, you know, pe you know people like yourself, were, were they leaving or were they pushed out? Um, there were people that were pushed out. There were people that were pushed out. Um, you said that Albert Einstein had to accept. Well, th and that and that that was just what someone said. Okay. That was that was behind closed doors. Um, I mean, that was the attitude. Yeah. That was not written down anywhere. No, no. no but no, it no. was but it was clear that that was the situation. Mm -hmm. um, but it was universal. Uh, it was universal because yeah. I spoke to people in other med schools and they were experiencing the same things. Mm -hmm. It was not an inviting environment. Um, it just wasn't. But you made it through. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm stubborn that way. I have a cousin, a first cousin that I used to hang out with. Mm -hmm. Brilliant guy. He went to Tech as well. He went to the year behind me. Brilliant guy. Um, and he's always said that the difference, and, I, and he's more, he's more, He's got uh, more skills that would translate into success than I do. And he did not get as far. And he said the difference was your drive. Mm. You have, it's, it's kind of unstoppable. And, that's, and, and, and I think that, that is the case. I think he's right there. Because uh, he definitely had more talent. Mm. Much more talent. But he did not have my drive. Can I help ask a clarifying question? Sure. How many Latinos and African American students in your class who finished when you did, or about when you did? In, in at Einstein? In school, yeah. Hmm. It's probably 180, I would say, let's say 20. And, and African American would be the right term because some of those were internationals. Mm -hmm. They were African descent, but not African American. So, of 180 graduating class, I'm kind of trying to visualize that picture. 15, I would say. And that might be generous. Because I'm, I'm looking at across across several years. I don't I don't think there was 15 in my class. Mm -hmm. I think there might have been 25 in the whole school. Kind of like the Brooklyn Tech situation. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I would I would guess ten to fifteen. Well, I'm wondering, did that did that experience sort of impact any of your career decisions, or and sort of where you ended up? No. Or what you ended up doing? No, it did not. It did change how I, I interacted with. While I was there, it changed how I interacted with everyone there. Mm. I mean, I kind of became untrusting of anyone and everyone. Um, but it wasn't paranoid, you know, because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Yeah. They're out to get me, and that's pretty clear. No, it was students, other students, administrator. Uh, students, not so much. I mean, they were pretty. I mean, everybody. They were so focused on their own. Yeah, stuff. yeah. They were. They were. You know, everybody was struggling. I mean, everybody. Everybody had the burden of having to get genetics and neurosciences. Yeah. I mean, they didn't have time to be harassing anybody else. I mean, they just didn't. Yeah. It was the people in power that were the ones who were uh, an obstacle and can, and can be an obstacle. Well, I guess the reason I ask that is because you ended up. All right. Well, yeah. I guess it would have been. I'm just thinking back. I mean, so but you you never had any um, desire though to become an administrator. No. Like that, though. No. It was always about clinical practice. Okay. I didn't. I, I never had interest in laboratory work, and they had MD PhD students who were primarily scientists. I did. So didn't have that interest. But it was always about working in a clinical setting. With. Much with younger. kids, yeah. yeah, with kids. Well, so I, I, I'm wondering. So, how did you end up in the, the public health services? Then? The public health service became, uh, for, for me, became um, an option when they financed the last two years of medical school. Hmm. So I did five years of public health service. The first two years were payback. That was the one aspect. The other was my intention was to return to New York City to practice. My wife at the time didn't want to come back to New York City. She wanted to leave the city. Mm. So that was going to be a point of contention. The Public Health Service offered me an opportunity to forcefully leave the city and, and then decide, well, could we, could we manage being away from the city? Because mm -hmm. the real city, you know, I, I, I grew up, I mentioned the 23rd Street, 1st Avenue, where I was born. I did my residencies on 17th Street and 1st Avenue, six blocks down the street. And my mother claimed that the park behind the hospital is where I learned to walk when I was a year old. In that hospital, I took care of patients whose parents I grew up with in the neighborhood. <coughs> so my, my, my fantasy was to come back to the city, but perhaps even in my own neighborhood, and have an impact. Mm -hmm. Um, Montana, which is where we lived, my core agency, uh, which was two miles west of the coastal battlefield. We lived in houses. Never lived in a house prior to that. I lived in apartments. Uh, we were we were an hour away from Billings. It was a sixty mile drive into Billings. Um, so. It was a different universe altogether. Um, but the discovery there was that people in need were people in need. And it was really about the socioeconomic situations that narrated that story. Mm -hmm. So the stories were the same, but the, the characters were different. But it was the exact same story. And that's where the realization came to me that my impact might be felt wherever I wind up. That, and when I came back to New York City the first time from Montana, I felt out of place. Mm -hmm. I felt this, uh, when I, I remember coming off the plane at LaGuardia and walking through the airport and all of a sudden a switch going on and I started scanning grabbed my son and told him I wanted him in front of me at all times. I don't want you drifting to my left or drifting behind me in front of me at all times. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and said, okay, 
and my wife tucked her bag, her bag between us, and I brushed my wallet, and that's when it hit me. I said, oh my God, this is how we live here. This is how I always lived in New York. And it went, automatically went on. That's when I said, I don't think I could do this anymore. I mean, it just takes an incredible amount of energy to be on guard all the time. Mm -hmm. And in Crow, which is Crow Agency where I live, yeah. that, that just, it was the opposite. It was, you know, I'm, I'm walking back from the post office and this native uh, Crow uh, uh, comes up to me and says, yeah, Doc, I hear you're going to New York for the holidays. I'm saying, yes, then who are you? I said, oh, I'm so-and-so. My sister works at the hospital when she... So it, there was an air of innocence that was refreshing. Uh, we used to shop in a store where they hand you a wax pencil and you needed to put the price of the item as you picked it up from the shelf. It, I mean, it was a way of life that I just was totally alien to me. I mean, it was just, it took a little bit of adjusting to. The degree of niceness was, you know, you get top of gas and the guy wants to know how your fishing is going, how your hunting is doing, how's the family, and I, I don't know what to do with that. I'm stuck there thinking, I just, I just came in for gas. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a whole lot more than I can do right now. And once I had been there for two years, I could not go back to the city. It was, it was not going to work for me. And so the original plan of Sonia and I wanting to go back to the city had won out. But it had won out because we had tested the plan and yeah. she was right that we, <laughs> we were better suited for another place. What? I mean, Crow, the Crow Agency has a connection to, you know, Cumberland County and Carlisle because of the Indian school. Right. I'm just wondering, what, what were some of the, um, some of the, the issues that you, that you were helping to address? Or That was an interesting experience because although I don't regret ever having done it, I would never repeat it. It was, uh, that's where I learned that when people have, lost the ability to direct their fates. I, that's what I learned there. They, have, they had beliefs in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And I, I had a good friend there, Pat, who uh, we would get into heated conversations over that whole debate about over beers, and he's telling me the beer. I said, but Pat, they don't have your, they don't have your people's interests. That's not their, you know, yeah. do you, you have a treaty, yes, you have a treaty, they have the biggest reservation in Montana. They're not well liked, the Crow not well liked because they scouted for custom. And you could not put a Cheyenne and a Crow in the same room. I mean, we took care of Cheyenne as well. Um, and we had these debates and I'm thinking if you guys, I mean, you have, you're basically an inter independent entity. If you ran your own show, you can help all your people. And it, it, was, um, it was an interesting experience because they, they consistently sabotaged their own mm. work. I mean, they, they, they just didn't get it. And, and it was a hard, hard two years there, but it was, it was enlightening to me. So I, I'm thinking, I said, okay, at least in New York, the people who are not doing great things, at least they're not sitting there waiting for something to direct them. And Crow, my sense was that, you know, folks were stuck in one position until something or someone came along and pushed them in another direction. But they could not, they could not, and this is, this is from a guy who was driven, they could not take the initiative. So the people in the leadership role, their families were doing well, everyone else was struggling. The alcoholism problem there was unbelievable. It was just, I've never seen anything like that. Um, and they, they just could not be supportive of each other. It was, it, was, it was disheartening to see. It was frustrating. Uh, and you mentioned the, the Indian school. If you were there with public health service, you were either there because you, do, you went there instead of doing jail time, you went there because you didn't have any place else to go, 
or you were there doing some illicit experiments. That's the, 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 popu the patient population's attitude about the physicians. And it stems from the days when they were sent to sanitarium, mm -hmm. they were brought to the Indian school, that people were taking from them and whisked away. That's what we had to contend with. Mm -hmm. So we would never uh, trust it. I was going to say accept it. Acceptance is not I mean, part of the equation, but trust it. So we were there with some ulterior, for some ulterior motive. Ironically, the group I was there with was an altruistic group that was totally interested in helping the people. Yeah. And I, naively thinking that it was a person of color was going to make a difference, did not make a difference. It did not make a difference. Well, it, you know, it's interesting, but they, they still, they still were, you know, extremely, I know, I was going to say accepting, but not accepting, but nice to you. Well, I think, you know, but, but, but these are people in need of your services. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of have to, you kind of have to. Uh, but it was, still, it was still very different from your experience in New York, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, well, and, 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 and the other thing, I like Crow, in Montana, when I took care of Crow, the kids don't speak English till they start going to school. So I started learning Crow, and I would ask them things in Crow, and they would, they would be taken aback by that. Um, you know, I would, I would actually have a few words that I could converse with them in Crow. And, um, and, and then, the, again, the irony is at the end of that experience is when everybody came to tell you how much they appreciated you and everything else. And a lot of, I think, dude, if you had told me this a year ago, things might have been different. I might have done my extra three years here. Because the, the landscape was unbelievable. I mean, that, that's the first thing that won me over. Was yeah, I was gonna say yeah, Billings or outside of Billings is a little bit different than oh I mean the hour the hour I remember the first time I drove into Billings and I borrowed someone's Jeep and I'm driving into Billings and I'm thinking something's not right here something's not right here and when it hit me and, and everything settled down was when I realized that the horizon line went all the way out to the extreme of my peripheral vision so when they say big sky country yeah. it is big sky country. Um, the one night that it was cold as hell one night and I'm looking up at the sky and I thought I was in the planetarium. Mm. It was unbelievable. I, I just couldn't believe it. So he said, okay, you're going to stay here. You can stay here. I need to get in the car. I turn the car off. You can stay here if you want. First pink skies I ever saw were out there. Mm. It was, um, it, I, I, I truly got countrysides out there. I mean, it was... It was an experience that kind of transformed me. You said you, you ended up doing your the remaining three years of in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, I was I got that job when I I went to uh, uh, a job site in Bethel, Alaska, for about two weeks because hmm. I I considered that, and frankly, if I had not been married, I would have taken that job. They needed a physician because a guy up there decided to quit medicine and go into full-time day dog sleigh racing. He wanted to do it for six months and practice medicine for six months. And they told him, we're not going to look for somebody every six months. We can't do that. I mean, you know, you either in or out. He left. He left. So I went up there, and it was uh, the southwest corner. The only way in is by boat or by plane. Mm. That's the only way in. This was in February. We had had a bad winter in Montana. A bad winter. I mean, some of the elders were saying, we hadn't seen stuff like this in decades. Um, made it look like a Bermuda summer when I was up there. It was, it was nighttime all the time. It was life-threatening cold. Um, and still, I mean, it, the place is unique. The place was uh, not for everybody. Um, but I could see myself there, but I could not see putting my family up there. And when it was out, while I was there that I got the call from Oklahoma. Uh, it was in Ada. When I first went looking for work with the Indian Health Service, I had visited Lawton which is okay. where they put Geronimo, uh, 
in prison, Geronimo, uh, and there's a military installation there. This was Ada, which was actually an actual hospital with a surgical department. I mean, this was, the place in Montana was, the radiologist came once a week. Um, there was seven beds in the place. We were all general medical officers. So we did delivery, we saw adults, we did everything. Uh, this place was an actual hospital. And it was a town about the size of um, Carlisle. About the size of Carlisle. And it was in Ada, Oklahoma that we ran into Alice, who was a Puerto Rican from the South Bronx. That was an incredible uh, serendipitous meeting, I mean, because, you know, we were like, oh my God, what are you doing here? Um, and so we became uh, very close friends. To this day, I still stay in touch with her. Well, I'm wondering, um, were you doing, you know, I'm sure you were very busy with, you know, raising your son and, you know, working. But we, I know um, at some point you got interested in, you know, photography and running. Right. What, was that inspired by any of this or no. the, the scenery, if, if, you know, Big Sky, the country in Montana? No, or? no. Running I've been doing in New York. I ran the New York City Marathon in uh, 81. Um, I, so I've been running. I ran the Montana. I ran a, a, a marathon in Montana. Okay. Um, it was... I guess we would call it therapeutic. I mean, I was running pretty, I mean, I was running six days a week, one day off, long runs on weekends. I was running, like running. Um, so that was always a part of what I did uh, as, as part of my yeah. time. You know, because when, when you're out in the bush, you wind up entertaining yourself. So this was a way that I would be Get get a look at the countryside. Uh, the photography was off and on. Uh, that started in earnest ten years ago. Okay, so that, that was more recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, um, I had always been interested in music. Uh, in Oklahoma, I would you know I would always hook up with some record shop owner, and they start developing, uh, noticing my taste, mm -hmm. and, and, and will be suggesting, I said, listen, this, the only guy I know who might be interested in this is you. Uh, and I might add, uh, my interest is, is always in uh, international music, mm -hmm. which brings me back, my theory is that because of my hearing loss, Lyrics, when sung by musicians, have always been difficult for me to follow. I don't have to worry about that when I'm listening to a foreign language. Mm. So uh, I suspect that that's the seed of that interest. Well, did you have um, any, I guess, interesting mishaps or experiences when you were out running in Oklahoma or Montana? Oh. Specifically maybe with a cow? Oh. <laughs> Actually, I have been having some back pain, and, and so I bought a bike in Montana. Okay. And I had the bike not that long. So I was riding it out to uh, the Custer Battlefield. At the Custer Battlefield, you have the site where Custer is for it, and then the Reno site. Reno was coming in to reinforce Custer, mm -hmm. but he got stopped by another group of Indians. There's about a half mile incline there of significant grade. Mm. So I was going to take that up and then come back. Coming back, <clears throat> coming back I was kind of uh, tucked in on my stiffest gear and pedaling. So I was probably hitting 20 miles an hour on my bike. On a downhill that was easy to do. So I'm tucked in, I look down, look up. When I look up, there's a cow standing on the road, it's open range, so the cows yeah. travel around. The cows standing both covering both lanes. So now, um, mind you, this is all in nanoseconds. Okay, so do I brake and slide under the cow? 
I kind of threw that off the, 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 the options because we, I remember we took care of a guy they brought in, took care. They brought a guy in from the rodeo that a bull had stepped on his chest and ripped his hilum. That is mm -hmm. the connection where the two lungs come together in the middle, ripped one off. He lasted five minutes. So I'm thinking this, this thing, probably 1,200 pounds, lands on me, nobody's out here, no. Go off to the side, there's a, there's a drop. So I'd be airborne and then landing in the sagebrush and there's snakes out there. The last option was to just make contact with the cow. So that's what we did. The cow must have thought it was the biggest horse fly that ever bit it, because I don't think it moved. I went over the top. I was airborne, I don't know, probably 10 feet. When I came down, I probably slid another 20 feet. Um, I broke my pinky. In fact, you see that, you can see the fullness? That's my memory. And that was the last time I rode my bike without a helmet. Mm. So on the way down, the car had gone up. So I tried to get up, couldn't get up, tried to get up. I said, okay, I'll wait for this car to come down. They gotta come down, they, there's no way other way out. They, they came down, they put my bike in the back and dropped me off at the hospital. Which was got down two miles down the road. When I took the bike in to the shop, they looked at me like, what happened? I said, well, I told them the story. They said, okay, look, we promise not to mention names, but we are going to share the story. They couldn't fix the bike because every time they tried to fix the top tube, the down tube would collapse. Mm -hmm. Every time the down tube was fixed, the top tube would collapse. They said, we can't vouch for the integrity of this frame. I think you need to pitch the frame and get a new frame. So we did that. Months later, we, I'm working at a satellite clinic away from Crow. I mean, we're working at Crow. And I'm doing this satellite clinic, and it's just an outpatient, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, not much more than a storefront. And I'm talking to this adult patient about riding my bike out here, 70 miles, it'd be a good workout. And he says, yeah, yeah, and the cows out here are friendlier than they are at Crow. So I looked at him, and I don't know who this guy is, and I said, well, that's good to know. That's good to know that the cows are friendlier. And so that's the, um, the lifestyle that I kind of won me over. Yeah. Where, I mean, in the beginning, that was bothering me no end. Having lost my anonymity, mm -hmm. people know, know you and know your stuff and kind of into your business. But there's not that many people out there. When we would drive into buildings, there'd be days I'd see more guys riding bicycles cross country than vehicles. Mm -hmm. More wildlife than vehicles. I mean. It, there was just not that many people out there. So they tended to gravitate to one another. Well, I'm wondering, so how did you um, end up in uh, 1987 deciding to come to Carlisle? Carlisle. I had been, I, 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 in, in Oklahoma, um, it was too far and not easy to get out mm -hmm. uh, in short notice because, you know, there's really no reason to go to Oklahoma. So it's not like you got a hub there uh, in Oklahoma City. So, and this is before, you know, they had the basketball team and they, they got both, a, lot of, a lot more things going on there now. Mm -hmm. So we, I needed to come east, at least get closer to the family, because my family was still in the east, in New York. I have a brother and a sister, and my parents were there. And a headhunter was looking into Binghamton, where I have a cousin who lived there, the cousin who lived down by Chinatown. Yeah. Um, that fell through, and they said, but we have this other location, Carla. I said, okay, I kind of look at the map and say, okay. And interestingly, this was the first job that I ever went to interview on that I actually went with the family. So I came to Carla with the family. Ian and Sonia came with me. And we had visited a place in Toledo, Ohio, and we visited here. In Toledo, Ohio, they wined and dined us. 
here we wind up eating at people's places and their homes. And it was a very different experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, always, always cognizant of the fact that we wind up being outsiders. Um, and that's the one thing we learned in Oklahoma, that you can always, I mean, people will be cordial for you, but they're not, you know, one of them. Um, so raise that question. I raised that question with uh, the people who eventually became my partners. Uh, and, and, and they were looking at it from their perspective, so it wasn't as accurate as that. But there was a warm fuzzy that was felt from our experience here that we did not have in Toledo. And so we wound up here for 32 years. Uh, and it was the right choice. And then it was, um, it was in fact, once you're here, you realize how strategically located you are to at mm. least five major cities. In New York, Philly, Baltimore, DC, Pittsburgh. And I've been to all those cities I, for various reasons, yeah. events, sporting events, music events. Uh, it was strategically located. Well, <clears throat> How old was, was your son at this time? He is now, uh, this is 87, he's 10 years old. And um, he kind of blossomed here because he's a, he was always a talented athlete. Um, and, and that was his currency because he wasn't outgoing. Mm -hmm. um, and he's always felt comfortable in his solitude, but his athleticism always drew attention to him. Um, in, in Oklahoma, playing T-ball, the only triple play I've ever seen done by one person was there. He caught a fly ball, tagged the guy coming off third, and then ran back, ran down the guy, go trying to get back to second. Um, I would get to the games and they would ask, well, where's Ian? I said, yeah, he's, he's coming. He's, 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 he's going to come with his mom. I said, oh, okay. Uh, and it was here that um, uh, made a name for himself in baseball and football. That was playing on the, the local Little League teams and the high yeah. school team? Yeah, yeah. He, he, and, and I think what, what made him more ingratiating to everyone was his humility. Um, so he would interact with the weakest guy on the team the same way he'd interact with the best player on the team. And, and, I'll and he would never claim, and he would never make that claim. But, you know, you know, other folks would mention that, you know, he had a coach one year that the coach's son was playing for another team and came in up to telling Ian, what he had done in that game. And Ian is listening and saying, yeah. And then his coach, the kid's father, tells him, well, Ian, you're not going to tell him you scored a home run to win the game for us? That was how he was. Uh, he worked at Sunnyside one year and had played a football game in high school. Um, and he had an injury that he had to wear a cast on. So the guys at work asked him, well, how was the game? He said, yeah, the game was good. It was a good game. And then he came back the next day, and they posted the new paper, the newspaper article, and he said, "Dude, you scored two touchdowns in that game. You just, it was just a good game." Yeah. That's that's the, the, the nature of his um, demeanor. And was that was you know you mentioned that you just got into photography a little bit, but w was sort of watching him play, was that sort of the beginnings of it? Oh yeah, I, I, in my office, I mean people <coughs> people knew him because I'd have him at a football game. I have pictures of him playing a football mm -hmm. game. I have pictures of him playing soccer. I have pictures of him at track. Uh, yeah, yeah, people people mentioned that. He said, yeah, we always knew what your kid was doing because, you know. <laughs> or people knew him because of the pictures they'd seen sure. in the office. So it was, yeah, it was, uh, that probably would be the seed of it, the beginnings of it, because I took a lot of pictures of him when he was doing his ad. This is before I knew what I was doing. Yeah. Um, so you look back now and you're like, ah. Oh. 
Could have done that a little bit better. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a whole lot of pictures. I got about a whole lot better, but 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 I mean, the interest was there, um, and and uh, it kind of grew into this serious interest now. Mm -hmm. And then when when you came when you interviewed for the the job with Carlisle Pediatrics, did Sonia already have a job lined up or uh, she she. She she had she had talked to people here. Yeah, she had. So if she didn't already have one lined up, it it's happened soon after that. Okay. And she worked I think she did all I don't think she did Crestview, but she worked in all the other schools. Moreland, they taught Hamilton. She didn't do Crestview. In Bel Air and North Dickinson? Uh, she worked at North Dickinson. She was a primary, uh, so she was kindergarten, first and second grade. Okay. Um, she finished in second grade. At Lee Thor, she did a blended class where she had half the class was first grade, half the class was second grade. And that's what kind of finally drifted her to the second grader. Because she'd tell a joke, the second graders would be laughing and the first grader would be clueless. So she kind of drifted to second grade because there was a little more back and forth. Okay. And you mentioned before we, we turned the camera on that you had a, a lot of her students as patients as yeah. well. And they but they never quite made the connection. No. That well once they did they would they would come back mentioning that and uh, yeah. but yeah, many a times when I came to her classroom everybody was like, Oh, this is my doctor <laughs> I could say, Yes, that's my name is Rosario. This is Doctor Rosario. So yeah, it was it was always a chuckle to see that reaction. How long did she teach in the Carlisle School District? Oh, she was she was here. That's the way in fifteen. She retired in fourteen. So from eighty seven to fourteen. Wow. So she started kindergarten, and ended up in second grade. She had done, she had early, she did early development. When she first started, she was in an early development program, and then that phased out. Uh, and then she started working the lower grades. Um, at Lee taught, she did first, second blended, and then first. At Moreland, it was strictly second grade. But when she when she did her first tour at Moreland, it was with developmental first. So it was kind of a special program for kids who came out of kindergarten but not really ready to go to first grade. They did the one year of developmental first. Well, I'm wondering, um, sort of, how, how did your, uh, I guess, job or position change over time? You started in 87. Was that just, you know, as a... I don't know the, the structure as an associate or you work yeah you, you come in you come in and you you here not probationary but but you're not eligible to, for partnership till till three years so you kind of want salary um, and then after that you become a partner okay uh, and when I came I was the fourth person here um, a lot of work back then. We used to do it differently. I mean, every, you know, as you know, everything has changed. But certainly, in medicine, things have changed dramatically. Um, it was a whole lot more time demands. Did you just, you know, less time to spend with each patient, or just faster turnaround? Well, it was. It, we did call, and we covered the hospital, so we had to go okay. to the hospital after hours. Uh, they we always work seven days a week. We have hours on Sundays. Mm. Um, the only day that they actually close close is on Christmas Day. But but even then, someone's on call. Back in those days, you had to go to the hospital see patients, uh, attend deliveries if there were emergency deliveries, and that can happen you know yeah. middle of the night, uh, which was always a. Uh, Folks' contention. He said, "Well, you know, you got work tomorrow. You're coming in so late from a concert." I said, "Well, you know, if I'm working and I come in at two in the morning, and I got to go to work the next day, so this I'm coming from a concert. I get it at two in the morning. 
and I got to go to work the next day. What's the difference? I'm a lot happier coming from the concert than I am from coming from work. Yeah. So um, that has changed because now it's just phone. You're on call, but you're only dealing with telephone calls. Okay. Um, yeah, that was uh, interesting times. So you retired when it was easy. Yes, <laughs> but but you know, still work. It it, it what, what's today? Today's twenty third. Yeah. It was a year two days ago. Okay. I've been retired one year. One year. Yeah, uh, and it's been an interesting year. Um, um, spent lived in Washington D.C. for a little bit, for about five months. That kind of uh, rekindled my urban interests. Um, it's been uh, and and. I don't miss it. Yeah. If I had to do it again, I would. I would do it again because it was definitely the right choice for me. I'm wondering. I mean, so you started over 30 years ago. I mean, did you were you ever able to see the direct impact that you had? I have. I have had individuals who have come up to me, and um, well, let me let me put it to you this way. At Sonia's funeral, mm -hmm. some young people showed up who were like seniors in high school, freshmen in college, that we had both crossed paths with, who came back to tell us how Sonia had impacted them, that they would be remiss if they didn't come and say goodbye to her at this point. Mm -hmm. I've had folks who, young men working in, um, Right, aid, who came up to me and said, you know, you guys, you in particular, impacted on me. I'm going to be going a physician. I'm going to become a physician's assistant because of you guys. The way I look at it is this. You throw a pebble in the pond mm -hmm. and the ripples begin to get away from the center. The people that have impacted, they're out there, and I may not ever yeah. know who, who uh, that happened to me while I was in med school. Some young person came up to me and told me that I had influenced them. And I'm like, dude, I don't even know you. I said, well, you know, but I've heard your story. And because of your story is why, you know, I've decided to do what I'm going to do. It was your. I have a cousin who is uh, 20 years younger than I. And now that we're both adults, we're kind of connecting. And he said the same thing. You know, we heard stories when we were young about you, and you're the one who... So, so that, the, the reason that I went into it yeah. is playing out. And, um, and I'm sure more times than I know of, but I'm certain that it, it is playing out. And that I know about it or not doesn't really matter if it winds up having its, its impact. You mentioned that you had a lot of photos um, of your son, um, sort of in your office, and um, but I'm wondering um, in exam rooms as well. Were, were there photographs there? Yes. Right. Yeah, there were. There were the exam rooms is really the exam rooms. I had three. Okay. And each had a theme um, because that's the only way folks. We know get get to know who you know who you are outside because my contention has always been that medicine is what I do, that's yeah. not who I am. Sure. So medicine is a part of it, but there are other parts of it. So there's one room that was all New York City, and all the photos were New York City, and I would change them as I would get some new photos that I thought warranted. The second room was a sports room. And that would be where, you know, last All-Star game I went to, once my son got older, I didn't have pictures of him anymore. But there were pictures of him and I at functions. And so sports oriented. And then the third room was a music room, which everything related to, to music. Um, and those are three aspects of a person that I am mm -hmm. that I would and, you know, over the years, people have mentioned that. I, the people have mentioned that. Yeah, I remember you used to have pictures of your son in the room. 
or pictures of, you know, concerts you went to. Uh, my involvement with Amani was mm -hmm. in the music room because uh -huh. it was related to the music. Well, I, I have a question here. Who is Pepe? Are you we were talking about uh, my different names. Mm -hmm. So, on the radio station, I am Gustavo Sebastian, Guts for short. I was going to say, I have that written down, and I never would have pronounced it that way. So. Gustavo Sebastian is the, the name I decided to use on the air. And that came about because when I first got here, I told a story to one of my partners about somebody I knew in New York who referred to himself as Gus. And I said, Gus, what, what, what's that about? He said, well, if the police come and they're looking for Gus, we don't know who that is. One night, I'm in the emergency room, and one of the ER docs is calling Gus. So I turn around, and I say, you talking to me? I say, your partner told me your nickname was Gus. So in the office, I am Gus. My mailbox says Gus on it. They refer to me as Gus. And we've had students, medical students, who come rotate through. I say, who's Gus? I said, Dr. Rosario. Now, most people there call me Gus. There are a few people that call me other things. Pepe is one of the names because I used to have a black streak that went across the back of my head. I think it's almost gone now. A little bit. And somebody called me Pepe after Pepe Le Pew, the skunk, sure. with the cat. Uh, in some circles, the Amani circle, some people had trouble saying Eliseo. They referred me to strictly as Doc. That's how they knew me. That's how they introduced me. I have a very close, dear friend that's you know almost family. That's oh, he always introduces me as Doc. He does. He, he does. I've never heard him say Eliseo. For that matter, come to think of it, I've never heard my son say that name. I'm gonna have to press him on that. It just occurred to me. So so. And then one day, we, we, we purchased some furniture from a company called Love Sack. And they called the office, and one of my front office people answered the phone. They said, Love Sack, what is that? That's the name of the company. I mean, okay, that's, she calls me Love Sack. She's the only one that does that. And people are like, really? So, so Love Sack, just for that person. Um, Doc, for a large group of people. At the radio station, people have come looking for me, asking for Eliseo. And they say, who? Eliseo Rosario. He does a show on Thursday night. And they say, you mean Gus? I think his name is Gus. I said, no, that, that's, his name is not Gus, but yes, that guy. I'm looking for him. And then my wife, and she's the only one that ever called me Nuno. One year, it fought him. I, Mama Eliseo Rosario Jr. At one point, I mispronounced it, and it came out Nuno. That's what she called me. And some, one time, somebody else said, I said, no. That's the only person who could call me that. No one else knows about that, nor do they need to. Well, everyone else knows. Now they know about it, but, but I'm not going to answer to that, because that's... That's just not something that's common knowledge. Well, it's, uh, not, well it wasn't common knowledge. It wasn't. Well, yeah, it is now. <laughs> that means that you know what that means now, right? I don't know. It means I need to move out of the state now. What? Move out of the state because. Okay. Like, well, you know, you got, you got DC. <laughs> so uh, you, you mentioned uh, the Imani Festival and uh, the radio station. How did you get involved? Well, we'll start with the Imani Festival. How did, what was the sort of the impetus, and how did you get involved with it? Well, I, I, like I told you, I've always made acquaintances of whoever owned record shops. Mm -hmm. Floyd Stokes used to own the record shop. Protégés. I remember the name of that. And I'd go into Protégés and get music, and he noticed, like they always do, says, you've got kind of unusual musical tastes. So he had this brainchild of this multicultural festival. And he approached me about being in charge of the entertainment because he realized I had 
a, a, a very large palette of musical interests. I said, okay, I, I can do that. I can do that. Um, and then a couple of years down the line, Dickinson, he's the one who got up that offer to do radio time on the, we were going to do two hours. He was going to do an hour of jazz, and I was going to do an hour of international music as a means of promoting Amani. Perfect. He never did his show. My one hour turned into two hours. That's going on 22 years now. Um, and Amani I was involved with for 14 years. And then when, when Floyd left, um, I chaired it for a couple of years. But that was labor intensive. And it, it, it reminded me of a marathon. You run the marathon and when you run to like the 23rd, 24th mile, you're wondering, why am I doing this? And then you get to the finish line, and your first thought is, I can improve on this time. That's how that was. You worked all year long, and you were just thinking, why am I doing this? And then the day after the festival, you say, that went well. I think we, we, can, go by, we can go another round. And that went on for like 14 years. Because uh, we would, Floyd and I would go to other festivals looking for international music. And I was a stickler about now repeating, so I always wanted to be something different. Mm -hmm. uh, and people would say, well, we want that band that came the last year. He said, well, I ain't coming back next year. And it was there that I learned uh, there was a band from Philadelphia playing plena, which is a type of um, country Puerto Rican music. And this band is playing, and this white guy is over here like, you know, bobbing and swinging to the music. And I walk past him and he says, well, who are these guys? And I tell them who they are and the kind of music they're playing. And that's when it hit me that you just don't know what people are going to like. And that's why I was always bring something else because somebody out there is going to say, oh, yeah. I never heard of this before. I have a listener on my show. He calls everybody every four or five years, Ron to tell me that he's still listening, that he doesn't like everything I play, but that he comes back because I just never know what you're going to play. And often enough, you wind up surprising me. Um, putting it out there because you just don't know what you don't know. And until you've discovered it, it, it stays hidden from you. So, so when can we listen to the... Uh is it the R International? The International Hour. International Hour is the name. That's O R O U R. Yes. That's the show. And uh, it's two hours long, and, and um, it, it has become, I always used to call that my mental health gig, away from work. And it is more that than I realized. Because when I was in Washington, I was doing it remotely. Mm was not the same experience. It was labor intensive and I really didn't get, I didn't really get what I get out of it when I'm in the station. Mm. When I'm in the station, it's a totally different experience. And there are shows that I feel better about than others. I do an annual show, which is one of my favorite ones, which is multilingual. So every song on that show has at least two languages on. I also have a once a year show that I call a non-secular show. So secular is non-religious. Mm -hmm. so this is non-non-religious or religious implied. So anything that has any implied religion to it, you know, Losing My Religion by R.E.M. makes that show. Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah makes that show. Mm -hmm. Beyonce's Ave Maria makes that show. Um, as, as a means of, because it gives me something to be searching for. I'm always listening to that, oh, I can use that. And I only do it once a year because it takes me a while to. The end of the year, I always play a show where a uh, musician that we lost this year. That's an end of the year show. Next month, I'll do the albums of 2019, the international albums of 2019, uh, which is always an annual show. Um, I have a blast. 
Uh, it allows me to continue to listen to music uh, and put it to use. Yeah. Because what I play there is all my material. And when can we tune in to that? Thursday nights? Thursday nights. 8 to 10. 8 to 10. Okay. My last show, I did my show last week, it was uh, Arabic jazz. Jazz music from Arabia, which doesn't always sound jazzy, but that's okay. This is how this is how they're defining it, yeah. and and you wind up saying, "Hmm, that's interesting." So you listen to it, and and I have found that there were there are tunes that I've picked up, and I I did not like them. Several years later, I listened to it again. And clearly the tune hasn't changed, but it's changed has been, you know, me. Yeah. Or, or some aspect of the musician that I didn't know when I listened to it the first time. Mm -hmm. Something that I learned that now caused me to listen to it with a different set of ear. Yeah, that's interesting. So I find that most people, or maybe it's just because, but, you know, we seem to most fondly remember or enjoy listening to whatever we were listening to when we were in our teens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that... And that's why you have all these, you know, all these goodies stations. Right. Which I hate, by the way. <laughs> I hate those shows. Sure. Um, but it's interesting that, you, that you've come back to, to certain things. Oh, be, yeah. you know, I took a lot of heat when I was young for the talks I listened to. Yeah. And people would give me grief. A cousin of mine who, who I, I, I started listening to music, and I sent him some Eastern Indian raga music hmm. by a Western artist. And he's playing it for his guests, and they're looking at him like, what is that? And I, when he told me that, I said, well, welcome to my world. So, you know, I've had, you know, folks say, who is that screaming? I said, that's not screaming. That's the one playing bagpipes. I'm a big bagpipe fan, right. which, which doesn't square up. It was interesting that international music was what finally turned me to Latin music. Because I got to the point where I can talk more about Irish fiddlers and backpipers than I could about Latin musicians. Mm -hmm. And I said, hmm, something's wrong with that picture. We need to, we need to, you know, touch that up a bit. I was going to say, you're in good company if you like Irish music. Oh, yeah, yeah. Part, around these parts. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. No, I've always been a Celtic, big fan of the Celts. Yeah. Uh, Inland pipers, uh, Irish pipers and Scottish pipers. The, the first marathon I ever ran, and I'm pretty sure I didn't hit that mark around the 23 mile mark. I'm like, what am I doing? And that was probably more like the 12 mile mark. <laughs> but they had a bagpiper on the course. Oh, so that that was nice. Yes, that is good. I mean, I mean, those you know, you you hear about the stories when they used to go into battle with bagpipes. You can see why they would use those. Yeah. You know, you know, you've got a bunch of bagpipes playing at the same time. It makes your hair stand up. It's yeah, like those. really, really intense. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I don't know that I've ever heard a bagpiper at any of the races I ever ran. Or, or maybe they were there, I just was past the, point of, yeah. Yeah, past the point of hearing it because you're like, oh, dude, you just can't stay on your next step. Yeah. You know, it's people, you know, they, they say they wave to me and right. talk oh, to yeah, no, and yeah. like, You know, they, and, and you know, you're running with, you know, the year I ran New York was 25,000 people. Oof. But you're by yourself there. You know, you, you, you're totally by yourself because that crowd, is, you're lost. They, they, they're gone to you. Crowd, the, the fans. And, uh, I, uh, when I hit the 120th Street, 120th Street where I used to hang out, and my cousin was up to me, can I get you? And he said, dude, if you don't have it on you, no, you can't get me anything. I'm gone. I'm That's not how gonna, this works. Huh? Well, well I'm actually, it's one of the, the final questions I have is just, uh, you came to Carlisle and Cumberland County in 87. Right. And, uh, I mean, you've been involved in a number of changes, you know, implementing a money festival and, you know, being involved in the community. But I'm wondering, you know, what, what has changed or has anything changed since, since you know, you first, first came here? Oh, definitely. The, and the money in particular, because the money... Amani was driven by the energy and the enthusiasm of a small group of people. Mm -hmm. And when, when that 
group of people finally got tired and said, can't do this anymore. It disappeared for a while. The big change was for me, and, and we knew we had accomplished our mission when folks said, we need to bring it back. Mm. I met a young man one time who was involved with money, moved away from Carlisle, and moved back to Carlisle because of Amani. A young man in his 20s. And I said, really? I said, yeah, it's, it's because here, let me, let me put it the other way. In a big city environment, Amani is not much more than a block party. Here, it exposes our young to places, people, and teaches them that different is only different. It's not good or bad. Uh, soon after the 9-11 festival, we, ha we invited a poet who was living at the uh, War College. She was at the War College. And she had volunteered that, you know, I don't know if I want to do that, I mean, in this community. I mean, it's, this is not a good time for people like myself to be out here. We assured her that we could we would guarantee her safety. When she left, she said, I'm so glad I came. Because on that day, everything, all the differences seemed to disappear. And it had gotten to the point where there is a need for that. And Amani has become part of Carlisle's identity and the fabric of its nature. Um, which was a fantasy back in when we started this. It was, yeah, I mean, it was, that was the theory. We were saying, yeah, we expose our young people. They leave here and they wind up getting into a much more diverse environment and are already familiar with diversity and are comfortable with diversity. That was my thinking. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, we wound up accomplishing that and making it a necessity for Carlilians, which is, you know, we were, one, we were saying, okay, our kids leave and then they wind up going to a bigger world and they already have that exposure. We wind up having a group of people here who have a need for that in their backyard. Mm -hmm. Well, the, well, you, you said that you retired a year ago, two days, so it's been 367 days since Correct. you retired. You mentioned you were living in D.C. for five months. Right. What else have you been up to during that time? Uh, I took two photography classes online from the New York Institute of Photography. Um, you, can't, you can't get away from New York City. Cannot. And, 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 you know, and frankly, I like being able to navigate through there. Yeah. And I have a sense of familiarity with Washington now. You know, my, my wife's job took us there. That was an interesting exposure. Terry. Terry. Yep. Who, who, who was working uh, for the mayor. Um, that, has been, that has been an interesting um, education because those are, that's a pond I've never swam in, political and the arts. Uh, so she was there for the Commission of Arts and Humanities. So that had uh, me exposed in circles that totally alien, uh, totally alien to me. Uh, so I was in a new city that I was a perpetual, um, while I'm taking these photography classes, in a new city as a perpetual tourist, uh, going to functions that were kind of highbrow and out of my league, but I'm fitting in just fine, and and learning, like my my students here in Amani, learning about a world that I knew nothing about, mm. and being better for it. So it was short lived, but it was intense and very very productive. I mean, it it, uh, it kind of pushed me along the growth curve. Um, while I, was, while I was there, there was not that adjustment to retirement because my days were, let me, let me, let me just encapsulate it with this. I had a cousin that came to visit me in D.C. and we left that Saturday morning at 8.30 in the morning. We came back at 12.30 Sunday morning from the day we spent in D.C. 32,000 steps on my. That's still the benchmark that 
I hope to one day hit again. Um, because there was so much to see and do, so many pictures to take. Uh, the music scene was incredible. I mean, one of the first concerts I went to at the Library of Concerts, the Library of Congress, which was not seven minutes walk from where I'm living, was a band from Zimbabwe that I had, I had familiarity with. I mean, I knew this band. And I just stumbled on them. I was like beside myself. I mean, it was just an incredible, incredible experience. Um, the botanical gardens, uh, you know, you watch the people giving interviews in the back of the Capitol and say, oh, I was with that, I was there. Uh, it is, it is, um, it was quite, quite an incredible experience. And that, though I owe to tell you, it kind of was taking me on this new path. That, been quite a, quite quite uh, illuminating. So it's been a productive year. Yeah, oh yeah, it has, it has, and I think it, I think it bodes well for you know the setting the bar high enough so that you keep stretching and you keep growing. Yeah. Um, you know, there's always something new to see, always something, and you know, and that's why I don't like the oldie stations. They've been there, done that. I want the what excites me. When I'm listening to something, or I'm looking at something, it's, it's newness yeah. is what it's. The excitement of discovering something that really blows me away, purely by chance, just because I stepped out of the box. And you wind up thinking, oh my God. The, 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 there's a band of polio-stricken, wheel, wheelchair-bound artists. They got Album of the Year, 2019, seven years ago. They were in the street, they were homeless, playing in the street. Some guy came to rescue them and they said, mm, we don't need rescuing, we're okay. So instead, he exposed them to the rest of the world, they got album of the year. Right. Guys polio stricken and wheelchair bound, playing sukus from the Congo. You don't get out of your box, you don't run into these guys. Yeah. The question in most interviews, it's always the last one, unless there's any follow-ups, is, is there anything I've missed or that you would like to talk about that I haven't asked you about already? No, I think we hit all the salient points. I got my son into the picture, which I still contend is the best work I've done. <laughs> For all the things I've done, he's definitely the, the best of it. Um, I've been extremely fortunate. I mean, to have had a most interesting life. Uh, I've had two loves of my life. Most people are not fortunate enough to get one. Um, and 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 I particularly like that I have control of my time now. Mm. I really, and from the retirement, that's what I enjoy the most. That I have control of my time. So I work with a lot of people who volunteer who are retired. And they're, they always say they're, they're so busy now that they have no idea how they ever worked. Right. But that, that's what they enjoy is that, that control. Having control of, of your time so you're doing the things that bring you the most joy, which is a positive reinforcement to continue to do it. Yeah. Because success is what drives that behavior. So it's positively reinforcing what you're doing. And if you're getting a charge out of it, guess what? You'll be back. All right. Well, on that note, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rosario, for uh, talking to me today. Sure, my pleasure. My pleasure.